Good morning, everyone. Um, and I think I have to reiterate, I want to thank everyone for coming to Galway. I usually leave Galway at half five to head to Dublin, so I'm delighted to actually wake up in Galway this morning. And I'm hoping that more of these events will be in Galway. So just to um, introduce myself a little bit, um, I work in um, software for IBM and looking at the attendees list, I know it's maybe quite different to a lot of your roles, so I just want to explain a little bit kind of my perspective and what our customers are looking for and I think it ties very nicely with Jerry's presentation in terms of what we're hearing from customers and that gap and that transition in terms of the, the digital model. So. Um, most of our customers within Watson IoT are focused around um, enterprise um, asset management and uh, integrated work management systems. So they're very much looking at. Um, I just move forward. They're very much looking at um, asset effectiveness and operational efficiencies. Um, so in terms of asset management, we're very much focused in the operate and maintain phase and then for integrated work management systems. It can start uh, at the feasibility study through um, design, build, operate, maintain to uh, decommission. And so ourselves, we have um, focused on BIM and our products are kind of uh, key products, Maximum Asset Management and Tririga actually have BIM integrators and have them since 2015 and 2016. And what we understand from our customers is that real time digital data is central to the future of their businesses. So they are looking to us to help them to um, incorporate IoT and to get that real-time data so that they can start making um, more timely decisions about their business processes. And within our um, organization, we're also focused very much on AI. And AI can't exist without real-time data. And so what we're trying to do is identify how we can bridge that gap and we see Digital Twin as a catalyst for delivering that goal, that is the digital data. So the idea being to get to, uh, the idea of being able to get to a point where you have these intelligent assets, intelligent buildings, because it's not just the asset or the building th themselves, it's the data that's coming from IoT, it's using the, um, um, machine learning to start predicting and providing suggestions to customers. So while there's this mass amount of data that Jerry mentioned with IoT, we still have issues in terms of transitioning that into insights. So as you probably know yourselves, uh, the uh, ideal scenario doesn't actually meet reality. And so it's not as easy to then transform uh, insights from this data into, uh, into uh, evolving business processes. So for us, really, Digital Twin is the next step because we've looked at IoT and we've implemented that. We support uh, BIM integration. And the key changing point for us now is around Digital Twin. So the key thing being that the Digital, digital Twin is software. So immediately that speaks to us in terms of our in terms of our customers and their business processes. They already track you know, um, all of their assets, all of their locations, safety plans, job plans, preventive maintenance records. And the idea of being able to actually match that digital information with their assets, with their building's locations, uh, really appeals to them. Um, and for us, you know, there is a question or the, in the market about whether this is just another fad whether this is something that is an emerging technology is going to peak and then it's going to uh, pitch her away. And really, we don't see that happening because the digital twin isn't just about the asset, as we know, and the, the building itself. But the real gold of it is that the digital twin is about all the ancillary information. So it can be, the, you know, have a digital twin of, of, of your bomb, a digital twin of your maintenance plans, of your asset models, and housing all that information together so customers have immediate information, not just about the physical product and how it's operating, but all of the digital twin information around, um, around the other uh, topics as well. So this is how we see 
uh, assets evolving from the physical uh, into this combination, this hybrid of the physical and, uh, and the digital. So what is a, a typical asset now includes sensors that is capturing data in the cloud that then sends it to um, real-time monitoring, which is then able to observe the performance you know, of an asset and over time then is able to feed into predictive failure models. So with the sensor data and the real-time monitoring data and machine learning, over time we're actually able to start predicting failures in advance. And obviously that is key to make sure that assets actually um, stay, you know, stay online. Um, and you know, there's plenty of information about the cost of uh, some of the manufacturers having a line go down even for a minute. They're talking about thousands of, of dollars straight away. And so the key thing here is that we now have this combination or potentially a combination of the physical with the digital and it allows us to share information more, more, um, more pervasively. We're able to communicate between the OEMs, the owners and the maintainers. Importantly, it's not just uh, something that we're looking at in terms of software, the, but the market also identifies that digital twin is something that's up and coming. Now, we've seen a lot of these stats also for BIM, and I don't know, from your perspective, you know, we launched BIM integration 2015, 2016. Three, four years is a long time in the software world, and we would have liked it to have, you know, taken off a lot more quickly. Um, so we, we are conscious of the big numbers, but still, uh, within co um, companies who have adopted IoT, um, right now, 16% does seem like a, so, a slow, uh, low number in terms of digital twin, but the expectation is that that actually will multiply quite quickly, and that in a number of years, that 75% of, of uh, organizations will have a dig digital twin. Um, so within really, I think it's 2022, but actually they expect uh, quite a turnaround this year. So the key thing for us also is that we tend to be thought leaders, we tend, tend to be out ahead in terms of IoT and BIM and Digital Twin, and then you operating the, in this space have to actually go and implement. And when we don't see the, and I say this as somebody who was the product architect and designer for Maximo and Tririga BIM integration, we're saying to our directors, invest in this, this is happening, um, we're going to get a return, and they, you know, the return that they're expecting happens in quarters rather than years. So what we've done, and this is not unique to us, is that we've adopted Agile, as, as Jerry mentioned. We have a very keen focus on user experience, and technology alone is not enough. And so we use um, enterprise design thinking. It's an IDO uh, approach design thinking. It's out there, um, multiple uh, companies use it. And what it really does is puts your users front and center. So if we focus on the technology alone, which traditionally you do in software, you, you know, can deliver fantastic products that nobody uses, or it's not adopted, and then you're wondering why it isn't adopted. And so what we're doing is put a lot of time into understanding the people who are actually adopting it. And what their jobs are, what their pain points are, what their motivations are, and essentially what the, um, what the issues are that are stopping them from adopting technology. And it's often uh, things that it, they just have day-to-day -day operational things that are causing them a headache. And even though they want to move forward uh, with adopting new technology, it just simply isn't possible. So we need to take that into account because if we create the technology that doesn't uh, include the human factor, then the likelihood of adoption is actually, uh, is actually quite low. And I think that kind of, it's very interesting to hear that coming through the previous presentation as well, in terms of that focus on the user experience and showing the, the VR and you know, walking through the process and having them understand the feeling of the space and what it will look like as well. We do the exact same thing with our software design. So we meet with customers, we show them our designs, we talk through, we get validation, we go back, we iterate, we change. So all of the stuff we talk about with BIM and getting it right first in the digital before you move on, we do the exact same thing in terms of software. 
So taking that into account, trying to learn from um, experiences with IoT and BIM in the past, what we understand from our customers is that um, they're not always in a position um, or maybe not always inclined to even ask for the BIM data up front. Maybe they don't appreciate the value of it entirely yet. Um, maybe they can't afford it. And so it be, because of the whole life cycle or lifetime of a building, you know, it can be difficult then to go back and to try and get this data. So one of the um, approaches that we're looking at is uh, around uh, digital twin and having a marketplace or an exchange for digital twin. Um, actually, did I? So the, the um, Gartner study that I, that I mentioned as well, um, there's, a, there's a link on the bottom of it, but it was conducted last summer and it was um, published in February of this year. And um, while they're seeing uh, digital twin adoption across a lot of industries, they see that um, they see the, the peak essentially with manufacturers for connected IoT products. And the key thing being that they see an opportunity in this space for them to differentiate between their competitors by providing the digital twin. So now they have a new uh, service stream that they didn't have in the past, and therefore they have a new revenue stream, which we know obviously is very important uh, in this space also. And so when we talked about BIM in the past and creating the digital uh, data and having a look at the building or the, you know, the, the asset before moving on into production, one of the things that we talked about was how architects would start looking for, uh, for products that had this information and start actually um, favoring nearly products that had this information. And so we see the same thing here in terms of uh, the manufacturing products and the digital twin, that owners and uh, architects will start looking for products that specifically provide the digital twin with the uh, physical product. And that, that will actually become a driver for some of the digital twin adoption. So in this scenario, I don't know if you can see it very well, it's kind of a cyclical process, but this is kind of our, our to be or expected um, uh, um, scenario based on what we understand. And we're not experts in your field and we don't pretend to be. Um, but our key focus is on our enterprise customers who are trying to um, basically reduce costs and optimize uh, their, their business processes and how we do that. So in this scenario, uh, here, kind of top left, we have a manufacturer who sells um, a truck to a mining company. Nothing, nothing different there. We foresee that there will be somebody who at least will be part of their role, who will then start uh, ensuring that there's a connection of like a digital twin into their um, EAM or enterprise asset management systems. And so in those systems where they already house all of their data, they will want to also house or connect to the digital twin for those assets. So in this case, Raymond opens uh, Maximo, which is the EAM system, to look at the bill of materials for the truck, which has just been added. So in this case, there is no, there is no bomb, um, and the digital twin doesn't exist. So, in the event that we have uh, this digital marketplace, he is then able to search for that digital twin. I'm straining my neck a little bit. He's able to search for that digital twin. Um, it's not available, so he's then able to contact the manufacturer and actually request it. So this doesn't mean that the manufacturer actually has it available, but what it also does is it starts sending you know, supply queries to the manufacturer so they can start identifying. Maybe I've got a, you know, a couple of hundred requests for this particular product or um, you know, and maybe it's something we should start investing in. So it's also an information flow back to the manufacturers for them to understand um, a little bit more about the products after they, leave, after they leave their site, which is what they're also looking for. And it's quite likely with some of these manufacturers that they themselves have digital twins for the actual construction of their own products. What's also important about this, as I mentioned earlier, the digital twin isn't just the product or asset. So while a manufacturer can you know, make a digital twin available for an asset, there's a lot of IP that 
you as a community also have around some of these assets. And so you may have developed maintenance plans or additional information that's not directly around the product, but how uh, the owners can actually you know, maintain that product. And it's also an opportunity then to make that digital twin resource available and for you to essentially create a revenue stream around your own IP. So in this case at the top, we see that a third party um, offers a digital twin resource for sale, such as the maintenance plans. And the value for, um, for owners then is that they have this combination of digital twins, which we see is going to become very common. So it's not just the asset uh, digital twin itself, it's all the ancillary digital twins around it that they don't have to then uh, work out themselves, they're able to just purchase that from you and immediately um, upload that into their system. So in this case, Raymond picks from one or more digital twins. He may pick from the digital twin of the asset and there may be other options provided by other vendors that he also selects. And pays for them is the key thing, right? So uh, this is a scenario where the manufacturer, the vendor, is able to essentially create a, a, a catalogue of their assets that they're making available for purchase um, to the owner. And so what this will maybe do in time is really reiterate to owners, you could have got this much earlier in the, in the BIM process, but you didn't understand at that point. So we actually feel that the digital twin will actually be potentially a series of education for owners that they don't need to wait till the end and pay for it. They can start requesting this as part of their projects and actually feed the data in, in that handover phase. So he picks um, a multiple uh, resources and then a digital tin, twin is created from the uh, store resources. So in this case then the asset, which is already in their system, is tagged. And we talked about security earlier, so an encryption key is assigned to the digital twin and it's shipped to the mining company. So Raymond's then able to enter the encryption key into our suite of products that essentially support this market already and the data from the digital twins is imported. So this is a very simplistic uh, approach, I understand. And immediately there are questions about, you know, integration of data and multiple versions, etc. And that certainly has to be worked out. But in principle, we believe that this is actually a really valuable step forward, not only for the owners, but also for the manufacturers, uh, for other vendors, and for us also, because we're actually starting to close the, the gap, close the loop for our customers on the data that they need to move forward um, with that AI machine learning to really understand how, how their businesses works. So here then, uh, the, the enterprise asset management tools then are able to get insights from the digital twin throughout the life cycle. So they're updated continuously, so they're able to get the, that feedback. And that, so the asset either enters or continues in operation. Um, and it's continuously updated to reflect uh, the um, experience of the asset. So this continuity of information as opposed to, you know, prior to BIM that you would just, information would stop at a certain point of time. So there are lots of options about potentially what could be a digital twin and in time, you know, an AI model itself could be a digital twin, you know, for an asset, uh, for, for, um, for a building. So at any time then, the owner is in a position to share that information back to the manufacturer on the actual production use of that asset, feeding back into the manufacturer's own processes and their digital twin experience. So we feel like this closes the loop um, for all of the actors in the process. And so I guess one of the questions is, well, well, why would we do it or why are we considering this? We have you know, quite a large customer base already who are in this space. We get requests for AI, but then we don't ever get requests like, can you, can you use Watson or can you use AI to give me information? It usually comes in the form of, um, um, say for example, um, on Tuesday, I spoke with one of our um, pharmaceutical customers for Tririga. And all of this data is no longer about uh, facilities and operations. This data now is central to space data, space utilization, which now feeds into leasing decisions for companies on their bottom line, 
which is part of the work experience trend now that companies are looking at because there is, um, there is predicted to be a shortfall in, um, in top talent, as you might know yourselves, by 2020. So customers are now using their locations, their businesses, um, as a tool to attract and to retain talent. And part of that is retrofitting their spaces, looking at not just occupancy, but utilization, and how are we actually using the spaces? And are those meeting rooms at the bottom actually used? Um, and are people using the cafe? And are people using the, the collaborative spaces, etc.? cetera? Um, and so the question that we get is, make suggestions for me. I want, can you suggest how I can best you know, operate my system? Or how, can you suggest how I move people around? And suggestions comes from the machine learning, which comes from the data um, over time, which comes from the digital data. So this is feeding into a much bigger picture of where the industry is going. I think I'm up on time. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Thank you.